It's all turned on. Yeah. It's all turned on for the Q&A. Okay. Okay. And the cameras. Cameras recording. Okay. Yes. I will not be alone. Hey. Yeah. Minions were terrifyingly looking for you. It was kind of adorable. I started signing. That's why I figured it. I was like, I think he's already out there. He left away. Anytime you feel dumb, just remember that we're yeah. shake at Comic Con. <laughs> at least I'm not hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Self deprecation, it's a talent. Or you can just watch an episode of Cops. That is a really good point. Is Cops still going? I haven't had cable in the longest time. It's just like I have Hulu and Netflix, and if it's not there, it doesn't exist apparently. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. I had red hair previously. Yes. <laughs> I'm also a master of disguise. Come in over here with the mics. I know it's also a lot cooler. Wigs are hard. Yeah. Um, I'll let them. They can manipulate their mind. I pushed them towards them. I'm gonna try to Google Yeah, I did that too. I have a somewhat kind of. Yeah, I can hear him. Costumes, like do it, and then he showed up. Totally normal. I'm like, you jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I going to have a one fight with in front of the TARDIS now? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he my one consolation is the reason he's not dressed as Voldemort is he realized he ran out of white makeup, and finding white makeup at 8 a.m. in Olympia is apparently very hard. However, he had to shave his head and his beard off, and now he just looks silly. <laughs> So it's like, there's my consolation. <laughs> I will look silly for a day, but you, my friends, you got about a week or so. <laughs> all right, it is 12. So we're doing stereotype versus archetype. We're all on the same page. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so the definition of the... Oh, we should talk about you guys. I'm sorry. I'm at here. By the end of this, I'll be here. So we'll be good then. Not till the end. Um, so we're going to start, basically, we're going to have them introduce their lovely selves, and we'll have Ren give a brief thing when he finally gets his butt here. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go through a series of questions for most of this, and then I'd love to give the, about the second half or so a chance for you guys to ask questions, because this is really all about you guys, and what you need to know and believe from their brilliant minds and all that jazz. Um, so, David, would you like to tell them who you are and what you're okay. fantastic? Yes. I am Fantastic Dave Wolverton, aka David Farland, uh, and a few other aliases in various uh, areas. Um, I'm a science fiction and fantasy writer. I've written about uh, a little over 50 books at this point. Um, also an editor. I'm the coordinating judge for the <coughs> Writers of the Future contest, which is one of the world's larger science fiction and fantasy writing contests, if not the world's biggest. Um, and I. Uh, Gosh, this is my latest novel. It's called Nightingale. It's uh, uh, won the International Book Award for Best Young Adult Novel of the Year, and the Hollywood Book Festival for Best Book of the Year, and a few other awards. This is the uh, first book in my Rune Lords fantasy series, uh, nine book series. I'm finishing up book number nine. I'm at uh, page 570. I should be at page 800 by the end of the month. And, uh, and then it will be done with that series, which uh, has taken the life of my the length of my children's entire lifetime for me to work on. Um, but I've done a lot of other things uh, beyond that. I'm also a video game designer, screenwriter, and um, worked as a movie producer in Hollywood, and uh, I don't know, my wife has five chickens, so I guess I'm a chicken farmer now. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently a secret agent. I mean, yes, what exactly. else would you do with all those aliases? Yes, exactly. So, so um, hi, 
I'm Ellen Guan Beeman, and uh, I, I'm actually I'm actually really excited to meet Dave because I also worked in Hollywood and I work in video games. Sadly, I have not published 50 books, but I've done over 50 video games. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I have uh, four books that um, that were published with Bane Books. Uh, three of them were published with Water. Questions: What it's like to write that somebody else can tell you all about that. Um, and uh, Ren gave me grief about this on Friday for not mentioning that I also. Oh, sorry. I know what you're going to say. It makes me so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually uh, started my professional writing career writing for television, and I wrote for several shows, which I now realize some of you may have heard of. Usually, people haven't. Uh, the, the one that the, the, the one that, the work I'm the most proud of in television was writing for uh, Jen and the Holograms. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was, yeah, yeah. See, it's, it's somebody always sings. It's so bad. Um, and I also wrote for um, and somebody actually knew this show, Dinosaurs, and um, uh, Brave Star, Defenders of the Earth, and uh, uh, Moon Dreamers, which was a subset. Of Final Fantasy. <laughs> I didn't actually write. Ponies. That's actually what this is. But yeah, that should no, be a so. quote. I didn't actually write for ponies. <laughs> yeah, yes. But uh, anyhow, that's, that's the kind of stuff that I need. Hi, I'm Bren Cummins. I'm the world's loudest ninja. <laughs> um, I'm a really bad ninja, so I, I didn't make a good living off of that, so I decided to write. Um, I've written, I, I already heard your numbers. I only written, I've only written like nine books. That's all. Um, lots of short stories. I know, it's like, oh, I'm just gonna have three or... It's okay, I'm intimidated by all three of you. Not what I was going for, but okay. Um, and then also I helped found a, a local uh, publishing company called uh, Telaria Press. Um, we're really kind of a, um, an illicit band uh, cabal of, uh, of writers who, uh, who really thumb our nose at the system and decide, you can't tell us what to publish, we're gonna publish what we wanna publish. And, um, that's that. I'll get to my breath I love how water. modest that is. Yeah. Ren's awesome. Since he won't say it. So, stereotype versus archetype. Um, so, we could go through textbooks definitions, but we're really not interested in that because everyone has the internet. Um, so, what is a stereotype? Except for that one poor lady in the back corner who's looking around frantically. She's like, wait, what? Wait, wait, I, I don't, what is that? I was in an Amish colony all this time. I stumbled here by accident. <laughs> People keep asking who I'm cosplaying. I don't like, oh. <laughs> it would be so sad, but also funny. <laughs> Story note for later. Um, but what does, what does a stereotype versus an archetype, like what does those definitions really mean to you? It seems like a good place to start so we know we have a base in, in order to build on. Sort of. Okay, well, the, the, idea, the idea of an archetype originally was that there are certain story elements that almost seem to be born into us, that we, things that we do automatically and subconsciously. For example, in my very first novel, uh, I went and uh, I wrote a book called On My Way to Paradise, and, um, and in it I have my character has this big battle scene, and just before this big battle scene, he's in his, uh, he's in his humble craft flying across this alien planet, and uh, they're going along this river, and uh, it turns out that there's these uh, plasma gun embankments on the river, and they shoot down his hovercraft, and he gets dumped into the river. And I wrote that, and automatically I said, oh no, I've just written the baptism scene, uh, which means that he's about to become a changed man. And i like, I should erase that. And then I go, no, it's an archetype. It came out subconsciously. It's okay, um, and, and that's that's the way that that's the way that uh, archetypes work. You you shouldn't have to think about it. If you are thinking about it, you're working too dang hard. Okay, there are people who like to say, "Oh, you should go read Joseph Campbell's, you know, Here with a Thousand Faces and learn all of the little uh, archetypes and then put them in right in a row, and you've got a perfect story." And I go, "Baloney! That's not how it works. You know, you don't read that stuff." Uh, he, wrote it because these things come out. Uh, stereotype, on the other hand, is where you just do something because everybody else has done it that way and you didn't bother to think and, uh, how should I say, uh, come up with something new, come up with something original. Um, and so 
a lot of times people do that. So for example, I was listening to a comic book artist uh, yesterday that he was talking about um, uh, this character that he had created and uh, he said, you know, yeah, everybody in the industry asks, you know, so where did this guy come from? Where's his, you know, where, where's his, uh, uh, you know, what's his original story? You know, and he says, I've never really come up with that. And I was going, yay! <laughs> you know, I'm getting tired of finding out that he was bit by a spider when he was, you know, six years old, or he was exposed to radiation or hit by a comet or um, just a genetic freak because his parents were both in showbiz or something like that, you know? <laughs> And, and, and that's a stereotype, okay? Uh, everybody thought, oh, we've got to try to come up with a cool, uh, you know, beginning story for my character and um, a cool genesis, and it just became the way that things were done. And it's just silly, you know? I mean, uh, yeah, he probably does have a genesis somewhere. It'd be interesting maybe someday to find out about his genesis in the comics, but you don't have to start off every story with the genesis of where his character was born. Unless, of course, you're writing a heroic Greek fantasy uh, circa 2,000 years ago, in which case, you know, that was a stereotype to do it back then, too. So. I totally heard hit by a Commodore. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I like that. That's it's actually kind of new. <laughs> the Commodore smacked me, and I Those thought, I will be a hero. Yes. Oh, nice. like, what are, what are those, Get on that. That's me. Black singers. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and Randy. Easy, easy yeah. to say, soul musician. So that's just such a strange. <laughs> <laughs> what? That gold lame suit. It really has impact. No. And gold lame. So I, I was going to just. I mean, you covered a lot of how I do it as well. But um, for me, a lot of it with with when I when I realize I'm working. Character as an archetype, it is that there is something I call it, you know, emotional resonance. There is something going on with that character that, that hits us very deep inside, and I, I try to find those. Anytime I start working on a new book, it's always what are those moments that are going to have the, the deepest, uh, the deepest impact on the characters and on the readers. Um, but it is, I have to say, it is fun to look at modern works and see, you know, the influence of Campbell uh, in. In addition to being a um, video game developer and novelist, uh, I'm also a college professor. And I, I have a lecture that I give where we go through the Campbellian, you know, the hero of a, of a thousand faces and the heroic journey. And the example that I use is Star Wars, because for every stage of the Campbellian myth, there's literally a line of dialogue. In Star Wars, that hits yes. every single one. It's really, it's an amazing. Well, I, 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 I don't know if you know it, but um, but George Lucas uh, took a college class under Campbell. I know he, he did that. And when he wrote Star Wars, he took it back to George Lucas to get his. Uh, took it for George Lucas he took it back to Campbell to get his opinion. And uh, I remember watching a, a TV show where they had it, and uh, and where Campbell was talking about, oh, this is this is wonderful because it really hits on. You know this ancient story of technology versus the human spirit, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah, it was like it was like this was my thesis or something. Yeah, that that semester. Like, <laughs> paid attention to my class. <laughs> <laughs> you get an A, George Lucas. <laughs> I feel like you could argue that if anyone says they don't like the original three Star Wars, you can be like, hey, it's Joseph Campbell proof. That's right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's literary proof. <laughs> And then he brought the other three movies, they took it back. Flies. Too soon? For me, I kind of like archetypes um, because I like to set up the reader's expectations and then, and then sucker punch them. Um, like, for me, it started with uh, The Breakfast Club. Because it was a, a nice fundamental movie for me. And I watched that and I'm like, wow, yeah, I know that kid is in my school. I know that kid in my school. I know that kid in my school. No, I don't know that kid in my school. Oh. And when he came out, they took the movie and said, well, here's your expectations. You see us on the right. surface, a brain, a jock, a geek, whatever. But we're really this. And so I love that idea. I love setting up, going for the expectations. I, I especially like how, how movie... I am, a, I am definitely a product of pop culture, so a lot of my, my own inspiration has come from the things I was kind of leaned on. Yes, Star Wars. Um, but also I like 
I like people like, uh, directors like Joss Whedon, who, who definitely set up this expectation of, watch the first 10 minutes of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV show, not the movie. <laughs> and and he, from the very beginning, he starts it out of, oh, here's this helpless girl with this kind of, you know, sleazy guy. Oh wait, no, she's a vampire. <laughs> and from the beginning, he's like, I'm gonna make you look over here, and then I'm gonna throw something at you from over here. The, the sleight of hand and storytelling, I just really adore. And because all of us have been raised on these, these, these metaphors, these myths, these legends, this folklore, these, these expectations, as a writer, that's, for me, that's just fodder. It's like, good, 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 look over here, because while you're paying attention to this, I'm gonna throw a little 11 year old girl with a sight back here. <laughs> so I, it's, for me, that's it's, I, I love them because you can use them, not just blindly follow them, but use them as an understanding of the expectations of the readers and play with them. Well, not sure. Yeah. I I think that I actually love them too, and, and I use archetypes a lot. Um, but but for me, the point in the story is that I want to get beyond the archetype. I don't want to have one line of dialogue for every one of Joseph Campbell's uh, rules. Um, and I imagine you did get good grief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but but to me, it's it's like okay, you start writing about real humans, and all of a sudden you start finding that they twist themselves into archetypal shapes uh, very often, and and that's kind of fun. Um, I would also argue though that uh, if if you read with hero with a thousand faces, it makes it sound like all stories are archetypal stories. And if you read real stories, you find out very quickly that Joseph Campbell went through and cherry picked pretty well. Yeah. Uh, because you can go to Africa or you can go to the American Indians and find very little in the way of archetypal stories there. I mean, you know, you get the Popol Vuh among the, among the Mayans, and uh, yeah, you've got a good archetypal story there. And then you, the rest of the things are, you know, how Bear lost his tail or how Corn Woman made Corn Grow or something like that, which have, you know, very little, if anything, to do with archetypes. They're, they're more um, explanations of, of why the world is the way it is rather than an attempt to do that. And then, of course, there's, there's anti-archetypal stories. Um, I love in India uh, an ancient story that I heard about a prince who um, uh, recognized that there were a lot of poor sitting out by the gate and they had a big feast, and so he went and took food out to the poor. And his father came to him and said, are you crazy? You know, now everybody you know, now more and more poor people have come to the gates and everybody who enters our kingdom thinks that we're terribly impoverished and that we're all starving, you know, so don't feed the poor people. So he got to thinking about that and he decided that he was just going to quit eating as much as he should. And he went out and uh, sat at the gates with the poor people and, you know, started being a beggar. And uh, then the father came back and said, are you crazy? Now my own son is out here starving at the gates, and people are, you know, I think we're, we're terrible. And, uh, and eventually he realized that by doing that, he was competing with the poor people for food. And so he realized that uh, he should just quit eating altogether. Um, and so he starved himself and uh, died. That's a hero journey story, okay? What he did was heroic. And if, if you're a good, Buddhist who's seeking for complete emptiness and you know and this kind of thing, uh, and and he learned to overcome the world, but uh, but gosh, it turns that whole hero journey story on the end. He's supposed to figure out how to uh, you know make his father happy and save the people, save the, and, yeah. save the people, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, but I love those kinds of stories where they, you turn the archetype on its on its head. I always thought that archetypes really are a matter of perception. Like, whose perspective are you looking at? Like, um, uh, the, the Anne Rice, the first two Andrew vampire Andrew. stories, um, it, it went weird after that. But the first two were really good view of, like, here's one story where Lestat's the bad guy. He's the villain. He is, he is the opposition to the hero who's just trying to maintain his humanity. Yeah. And then you read Lestat's perspective, he's like, well, he's a whiner. Yeah. He's just, he is weak. His view of humanity was because he couldn't accept the truth about himself. And then suddenly it's like, no, 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 okay, so maybe Lestat's the hero because he's telling the story. <laughs> but so much of that archetype, I, I love that part of the twisting and that side because it allows you to see from a different perspective. I love, I love playing with the idea that this character who you think is the villain 
is actually maybe the patsy, the the un the unwitting thrall of the real villain, mm -hmm. or maybe he's a good guy who's just been in bad situations and was trying to be the hero. I uh, one of the characters I, I I really probably like way too much, according to my editor, is he thinks he's the hero of the story, and he's not. He's uh, he's a he's a He's a, a character of convenience. He happens to be in the right place at the right time, and he's like, "Oh yes, I'll, I'll go take care of this." Because well, sometimes be your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah. I'll, I'll go handle this. And like, uh, no, you know what? Why don't you go handle this? Won't we actually fix this? <laughs> and um, and I love that. I love that, that that in his world, in his story, he's absolutely doing all the right decisions. He's making the hard choices because somebody has to. And everybody else is like, "Yeah, you're kind of a jerk." <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I love I love twisting those those perceptions using that same you know oh here's what you think yeah. yeah is that using archetypes do you think or is that also sort of playing with stereotypes do you know because what I kind of think that if you actually use archetypes properly then they become stereotypes it's almost like yeah, they become so them. overused that everybody is is doing it and they're they're copying you and they're like oh gosh I want to have a hero just like Luke Skywalker and I'll give him a a sword, I'll have to change it. Tell me it's called Aragon. Not, not to disrespect another author, but I, yeah. I, I mean, I was like, wow, this really is kind of Star Wars. The, 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 there, are reasons, there are reasons why it all worked. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Jeremy Irons, why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that actually brings me to an interesting idea of just so that we can help sort of separate it. Can you think of an example of this character definitely is an archetype and this one is definitely a stereotype? Just because it is easy to blur those lines, sometimes with examples it helps sort of ground it in our minds of, ah, oh, I can separate that a bit more. A little crowbar space for the pot, really. The one person who got that. Let's, let's, let's cue the Jeopardy music. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> who is? Who is? Well, I, I, think, I think there's a I, It's a hard question. I, a I just asked them. Yeah. There's a lot of characters that, are, that really are archetypal. I, I don't think that, you know, one, one, one good thing is you go back in history and you say, okay, in Lord of the Rings, we have Frodo Baggins. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, the truth is Tolkien was never poisoned by the idea of archetypes that the word hadn't been invented yet. Um, and, so, and so you can, you can go through and, and do something like that or, uh, uh, with something like that, and that, that's really archetypal, but any time that you see a, I don't know, just a cheap, bad movie, and I, I, I don't usually remember the names of bad movies, uh, but, but so often I'll see somebody that is the stereotypical hero, you know, it's just like, it's just like whoever wrote about this character didn't think about it, and, you know, I, I've worked in Hollywood enough that um, I, I kind of poisoned on screenwriters and stuff because of some of the ways that the WGA uh, gives credit for movies. So if you, if you come up with a really great idea for a movie, then the director is going to have his girlfriend rewrite the dang thing so that she can steal your credit. And of course, in order to do that, she has to change it into something that looks 10 times worse than what you started with. And, and it happens over and over again. Um, and, uh, and so you gotta look at it and you go, gosh, what's the latest bad movie that I've seen? Uh, there's an interesting example, um, I don't know how many are familiar with the Evil Dead series, mm -hmm. but that started off very, very stereotypically horror, uh -huh. and then, you know, the third movie in, it suddenly turned, or, well, this second. is my boomstick. Yeah, it suddenly, it suddenly turned into something really, really astounding, and I think Wait, you're laughing at this? I meant it to be funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, um, but the first, the, the first Evil Dead is, is just a basic, very stereotypical horror movie. Um, the horrifying piece of the pencil. I mean, you know, oh, God. I mean, it's Sorry, funny. I shouldn't bring up that image. A, 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 good one, a good one is actually the latest, uh, the shark NATO movie. Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, what is the, that? The hero in there is so stereotypical that it's making fun of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's, just, it's just maddeningly funny. I mean, I was sitting there watching it, and my wife was going, why are they fighting? And I was like, <laughs> because it's a movie. Because <laughs> it's a it's bad movie. Because. Yeah. I think there's something to be said about a clever use of embracing the fact that it's a stereotype. Well, that's it's an it's interesting it's idea. Can a cliche be helpful? Yes, and it hurt my head so bad I decided it had to be genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, for example, look at, like, 
I've got an iPad, and sometimes I really like to use it for writing. Sometimes I use it for actual, you know, useful things. Sometimes I play solitaire. Um, solitaire is not uh, a brain-bending game. Uh, it's it's a palate cleanser. It's kind of to purge the brain of, of useless data, and like, oh, and now I can focus again. Or I didn't want to do anything interesting for that half hour anyway. Um, half hour. Sometimes, <laughs> let's say half hour. <laughs> We're gonna go with half hour just because it makes me look better. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes the stereotype I think is, is the same way. It's like, it doesn't all have to be high art. Yeah. It can't always be Downton Abbey. Sometimes we just wanna watch Top Gear. Yeah. But yeah, the truth is, I, mean, I feel like, one of my beliefs is, is I, I wrote a, an article 25 years ago where I talked about why people read. And I came to the conclusion that we do it as an emotional exercise. It's a sort of cleansing thing to help you get through the day. Because each one of us has all kinds of stress in our lives. You know, you've got uh, health problems, you've got spousal problems, you may have financial problems. You've got all this stuff going on. And when you put on a, uh, an imaginary persona for a little bit and start living through some really terrible crap, you know, like getting taken slave, being chased by dark lords, and you know, having your wife uh, Axe murdered in front of you. Uh, by the time that you come out of the story and happily on the other end, uh, you you really actually start you feel really good for usually three or four days. See, that's, uh, that's why I write. And then, yeah, I was just going to say that. I'm like, we're talking about reading books or writing them. Oh, wait, it's the same. I, it's the same thing. It's much the same thing yeah. because your your subconscious is informing you on what to write uh, because it's going through that same process for you. Yeah, it's amazing how we just write words. <laughs> it's your fault. Yeah. Yes. You know, I wasn't going to say this, and you forced me to. You forced <laughs> his hand. Uh, I'll just accept it. So, how do you use one of these cliches or stereotypes to your advantage? Like, take a hold of it, or yeah. So, I I just literally a week ago started a new project, which is um, uh, a little a little dark. We'll see where it where it goes, but um, it's a post apocalyptic thing, and I've got a character, and he's a he's a farmhand. And he's pretty darn cliche, but he is so funny. He is so much fun to write, and he's yeah. just endless jokes. And it's like, okay, that that is a useful use of a cliche. Yeah. And at some point, yes, he will, Hiram will display hidden depths of character and things like that. But at the moment, he's just there so that you laugh, yeah. in part because it is such a, a bleak landscape that I'm painting it. Mine, I, I took a challenge from my daughter who who wanted me to write a story about a girl that kicks butt um, in response to Harry Potter because she was just dis disappointed that it was all about a boy who I was waiting for Hermione to do something. Yeah, that was, that that was, was my daughter. Was yeah. She was just like, so Harry's big thing is they didn't die? That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not really much we of an celebrate active. that every year. Yeah. I didn't die this year. Happy birthday. Hey, I didn't die. Happy Harry Potter Day. <laughs> Uh, we went and saw the movies, we came back like, what do you think? She's like, that was stupid. Like, she's like, okay, they had Hermione. Why did Hermione do anything? Like, why did they give her the movie? Because she, she's smarter, she's better at magic. She's, she's cuter, too. She's yeah. adorable. It's like, and it's all Harry's movie? She's like, that's stupid. She's like, guys suck. <laughs> and I'm like, all right. She was a nine I, I accept girl, that. too. So. Yeah, she was a nine. I, like, yeah. I accept that. She goes, you know what you should do, Dad? You need to write a story about girls who kick butt and wear pretty dresses, and, and have talking monster friends. And they're princesses, too. And they're, and they're princesses, and, 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 and giant monsters, and giant robots. And I'm like, hold on a second. I'm like, okay, giant robots. And, and princess. And prince, oh, princess, okay. Tiara, uh, no, just cute hair. Okay, cute hair. And um, so, I, so I did. I was like, okay, so all these little things that, like, okay, so you're nine years old, what kind of a hero do you want? She was like, I want a girl who can fight monsters but she gets to look pretty. I'm like, oh my god, that, why don't we have more books like that? And so I, gave, I wrote her six. It's not a good dad. <laughs> but but I, thank you. I, I love the idea of like, you know what? Why aren't there more stories? Why hasn't that somehow become a stereotype? I'm glad it's not yet. But why isn't that, why did they all have to be about the hero? Why is it always the guy who does it? Why does the guy have to save the girl? Well, that's the stories that have been written before, but it's, 
I, I have a little tangent, I promise I'll be really, really quick with it, because it's a fun story. It's the story of the Easter ham, and, and this, this guy who was a, a web developer, his, his wife made the Easter ham every year by cutting the ends off and serving it, and he was just like, why do you cut the ends off? She was like, it makes it taste better. He's like, really? All right, so okay, it tastes good. Where did you come up with this idea? She's like, well, this is why my mom always, always cooked it, and she cut the ends off, and it tastes fantastic. He's like, oh, okay, weird, but cool. So they're eating at his mother-in-law's house, and she brings up the ham, and ends are cut off. And he's like, okay, I'm, I'm really curious. Why do you do it with the ends cut off? Because it makes it taste better. Okay, where did you learn this? She's like, this is how my mother always made it. Always made it taste fantastic. So he's like, okay, that I'm calling her. So he calls the grandmother, he says, you've got to tell me, why, why does cutting the ends of the ham off make it taste better? She goes, make it taste better? I have a really small oven. It won't fit if I don't cut the ends. <laughs> and so I, I love, I love digging back to the bottom of these, of these, of these archetypes and go, what makes this archetype an archetype? Strip away everything else that's irrelevant. Strip away all the, the years and layers of, well, this story and and Luke has to be a farmer and Han has to shoot second and all of a sudden there's <laughs> Han and my little bitter baby. <laughs> but strip away all that stuff, and what is the essence? What makes that archetype so interesting? What makes that so compelling of a character? And if you can find that, then it becomes a, a, a living, breathing thing. This actually gets into what's called resonance, and, and resonance occurs when you have something that, uh, that you write a you write a story, but it's so popular and so powerful that everybody wants to try to duplicate what you did. And so, for example, if you if you start reading romances, you'll often find that men have gray eyes, G-R-E-Y, which is the English spelling. And if you go back, you know, throughout history and try to find where that came from, well, it's because Heathcliff had gray eyes, you know, 170 years ago. And so now all heroes have to have gray eyes now. But Heathcliff went crazy. Yeah, I know. And like but he still had gray eyes. I, <laughs> I so those gray don't eyes understand what they're staring at me and going wild. No. Uh, but, but, but what happens is something something is really popular and we try to base it on. For example, if you look at, um, say, Pirates of the Caribbean, okay, that was really popular. Why was it really popular? It was popular because there's a ride called Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland. And all of you have been on it at some time in your life, practically. Why was there a ride at Disneyland? Because there were some popular movies back in the 1920s, the Errol Flynn movies, and they wanted to get something that caught the feeling of those movies. Why were there Errol Flynn movies? Because there were a lot of pirate books back in 1880 through 1890 that became extremely popular and had their own genre, in fact. Why were those popular? They were popular because in 1882, um, Treasure Island was written by Robert Louis Stevenson. Why was that so popular? It was popular because there was a book called, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. Yes, I'm very familiar with that. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm thinking the uh, Swiss Family Robinson was in 1828. Uh, so grandparents had read Swiss Family Robinson, they passed on Treasure Island to the kids. Why was that so popular? Because the very first novel was called uh, Robinson Crusoe, okay? And then, of course, Swiss Family Robinson when I saw that as a kid, I was eight years old, and I was like, Robinson, is that, a, yes. is that a Swiss name? Oh, no, it's not Swiss. Yeah. They named the Swiss family Robinson, so that it would resonate with Robinson Crusoe. Okay, so every every 50 years, we've had a big Pirates of the Caribbean kind of novel that uh, has fascinated a generation that goes over and over and over again. And if you want to get down to the root of it, you have to go back to that story. And why was that story popular? Does anybody know what goes before that? The wheel. <laughs> Shakespeare. Shakespeare's uh, uh, The Tempest oh, yes. would be probably the, probably the oh, word yeah. why that was so popular. Magic. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Before that, was it actual pirate? <laughs> before, before, that, before that, it was Odysseus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, goes back. I'm sure there are other pirate stories I'm missing in between. Um, but, but yeah, there's it, it's, it's this continuum. And, and things like that come back and they come back and they come back a lot us until uh, archetype becomes stereotype. Andy's literary comment. I got a book on it, by the way. And, uh, JJ20 is my booth downstairs uh, called Drawing on the Power of Resonance and Writing. Uh, this is something we use a lot in Hollywood when we're, when we're working screenplays for, for good life. Is it time again? Is it coming back? 
Let's check the. That's right. It's like an almanac. I can, I can tell you what's coming, but I'm not going to because I'm going to make all the money. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you know, one of my students was Stephanie Meyer with, with Twilight, and we were sitting down when we were when we were brainstorming the novel after class one day. Uh, we were like sitting there, and I was, she's like, "Okay, well, you know, vampires." I'm like, well, "I'm not sure it's time." But then I had to explain that sometimes you can make it time, okay? Because what you do is you you take the things that are stereotyped and you try to get to a new level, to try something that's different with them, and the idea of romance for 16-year-olds with a sense of wonder by using the vampires hadn't been done at that time. And I was like, okay, Stephanie, if you can write this book, I can't, because I'm a, I would consider a nasty old man if I did it. <laughs> but you're just a romantic young woman. Uh, and, you know, so, so we, we, you know, kind of discussed whether or not it was time, because there were, there were a lot of things going on right then. Interview with the Vampire was popular, and uh, we had these, uh, what's called the Century, the whole, uh -huh. the whole. I, I think it's the underworld. Underworld. Story, but yeah. the movies were just starting to come out, and uh, and I, I said, you know, what you got to do is when when Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, is dying, then that's a good time to uh, to uh, you know watch into something like this. It's got thirty million fans out there, okay? And uh, and coincidentally, uh, about a month after that is what she got. She had asked how to become the best selling author of Bento Water of all time, so I had to answer the question the best I could. Yeah. I, just, I just wanted to know how you feel about being the one who mentored Stephanie Meyer. <laughs> well, you know, uh, my, my wife is like, why are you telling all these people how to make money, and why don't you just go out and do it yourself? And the, the truth is, is that there are books that I can't write. Seriously, I, I couldn't have written that book. Uh, I, I literally would have been drummed out of business if I had tried. And at the time, there weren't any. Um, there, there weren't any, there weren't any uh, young adult contemporary fantasy novels in, in, out at the time, and and we were talking about that, and I said, you know, with the way that uh, Harry Potter is going, uh, in about five years they're going to need them. So um, there's going to be an entire genre of young adult fantasy that's going to come out, and sure enough, by 2005, we talked about it in late 2001 or early 2001, by 2005. Every single publisher started up a young adult fantasy line that year, uh, but Stephanie was right, like first in the door, okay, because we sort of looked at it and said this has to happen. Um, but I, I also work with, uh, I also work with Scholastic. I was asked to help them decide which big book to push back in 1998, and so I looked at all the books and told them to push Harry Potter, and they had already, they had already uh, put Harry Potter out. But the, as the head of the publishing company said, she said, well, our marketing people don't like this book or, uh, because it's, um, it's too fat for the, for, for, the, for the middle grade audience. And I said, yeah, it's written for grade levels too high, but I had to talk to her for about two hours to tell her why this was going to be a hit if they pushed it properly. And then they had to go re-release the book and put it as their lead novel and do all the advertising, and then eight months later, it was a bestseller list. But, um, but otherwise, they were just going to kind of work on it. So I actually, I actually add to that though. Write if, if you are interested in writing, write what you love and don't worry so much about the market. Because um, a friend of mine, Diane Wayne, has the uh, "So You Want to Be a Wizard" series, mm -hmm. which came out years before. Yeah, lovely, lovely books. Years before Harry Potter, mm -hmm. and then when Harry Potter went big, and uh, bookstores were like, and get people who are coming in who Looking. have bought everything that Rowling has written. Yes. Now, why don't you try Diane Wayne? Yeah. And her books did very well because it's they- It's called the halo well. effect, and, yeah. and it really, it really can be powerful. I, I agree with that entirely, right? We love my very first novel when I was 16, it's called A Wizard in Half-Life. It's about a boy who goes to a magic school and, uh, and really gets mad at some kids and uh, uh, basically nukes the school, so it's Columbine meets Hiroshima. <laughs> <laughs> I got 10 chapters in and couldn't figure out how to redeem him. So when I read Harry Potter, I was like, I really hope that he doesn't do you know, <laughs> 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 it. Just kind of goil, you know? yeah. Fortunately. But yeah, that's a 16 year old. Uh, yeah. That's kind of a, a valid. I, so I have had a couple of times where things I've written, and there is no relation whatsoever.
whatsoever. You know, they never saw the screenplay or anything. Yeah. But a movie comes out, and they're like, that's my story. Yeah. And to me, it's like, that's validation. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I, I just did I get it to the right, right market. I was on the right track. Several times, yeah. yeah. I have a whole folder in my on my computer where it's just like, yeah, stuff that somebody else ended up doing before I finished. Um, just at least like I had this one where we were, I was working on a story where it was um, a people, it was like a tribe of people, and it was kind of you didn't know, but it was post-apocalyptic, and you find out, oh, it's Earth, like 25 years in the future, and then we go see the movie The Village by M Night Shyamalan, which is why to this day I really hate that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Watch the movie three That's minutes. why you hate it. Well, I don't know. That Did you just, see Avatar: The Last Airbender? This was, this was, this was before. Um, that movie came out, and my wife and I were watching the movie, and three minutes in, I'm like, they're in the future. <laughs> she's like, what, what? Cell phone in the box. She's like, oh, your story, I'm like, I want to leave that. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that made me, I was like, I had spent months, like, planning this whole thing out, I had, like, this whole history written out, and, yeah. oh, it was... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 my brain has tainted it. Like it will always be, and actually, it wasn't even his. It was somebody else's who had written the novel like five years before. So, yeah. but then someone would read it and then go, "Dang it!" Yeah, yeah. yeah. I could have gone back in time, and released Someone's it, and gonna, stopped it. Gonna happen. <laughs> um, like bring us back to archetypes and stereotypes, really quick. Um, before we open up for questions, if you find yourself in the middle of a cliche. I, I guess I would, I would just say, what would be your advice to writers for just now learning how to cope or navigate this crazy? Oh, I was going to answer that earlier because uh, uh -huh. the, the truth is, is, if you find yourself in the cliche, if you love the cliche, I mean, it's because it resonates with you on some level, most likely. But you just have to figure out how you can twist it or how you can grow beyond that cliche, make that character more deeper, more interesting, and, and break the expectations. If you love it enough, it'll become genuine. Yeah, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Yeah, because yeah, a stereotype is, is a thin... That may be wishful thinking, but hopefully it'll work. <laughs> a stereotype is just a very thin, narrow doesn't character. That kill so, the stereotype. Yeah, yeah make, make, the character, make the character broader, and you move it out of stereotype. You know, give, give them some good flaws. Do horrible things to them. That's uh, Mercedes, right? Yeah, Jackie's yeah. favorite line is create wonderful, lovable characters, and then, do, and then do horrible, horrible things. <laughs> my, my wife likes um, interior design, and one of the concepts that she was talking to me about is the idea of defend or destroy. That you would look at your room and you go, okay, what am I doing with this room? What's the point of this room? Is it, it do I want it feeling um, uh, kind of old New Orleans? Do I want it feel like, uh, I, don't, I don't even know, okay, I don't know that sure stuff. I, I know like 10 color names. Um, but she'd have like, oh, do I want this? Do I want it feeling like a beach? Do I want it feeling like, um, you know, an old uh, Riviera, Italy, whatever. Just you take the essence, you distill it down to the essence of what that is. And if, it, if what you want to put into that room does not tie to that, you have to either be able to defend it and say it's justified, it should be here because X reason, or destroy it, get rid of it. It doesn't, it doesn't support your theme, get rid of it. So like, when I find myself in a cliche, uh, and I'm like, oh, but if, I, if he does this, then it's just what everybody expects. I have to say, well, does what everybody expect tie into where the story has to go? Or am I just falling into my own cliche? And hey, we'll be fun. And frequently I go back to my daughter like when I this main character that I had, was the, the angel of death character with a pretty dress. Um, <laughs> I get to a point where I'm like, okay, I write this as a, as a, um, a say, we'll, we'll say 30 something, that guy. Um, <laughs> What do I know about what an 11-year-old girl who finds out she's an angel of death do? What would I know about that? I don't. So I go to my daughter. I go, okay, so let's pretend you're wrong.
could do that we aren't doing in their case. I think it's important to remember that because of the, they keep referring to it as the democratization of arts history, but I, I love that phrase a lot because of how easy it is for people to, in their own home, make their own apps, make their own books, make their own albums. You can do it all yourself. You don't have to wait for the big publishing houses to say, well, this is what fits our criteria. This is what the bottom of our spreadsheet tells us will make X number of dollars, so we're gonna keep following that formula. Those formulas alter it somewhere with somebody taking a chance on a property idea that hadn't been tested, that began, that ar that was the archetype, the first of its kind. So there's now the tools available that you don't have to wait for the formula to be established. You can start the formula. Yeah. Right. So if I were going to be making a video game, I would do something like Pretty in Pink, and it would be about a nine-year-old girl with a parasol. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally called tips on that. <laughs> Right, we have two minutes. We're gonna to go to the lightning round. Questions, go. Cool. Uh, really quick, my question is about Sharknado. Uh, well, it's you know you talked about a lot about carrying around literary baggage and like work affecting your work, and so is artists and writers. Um, is there anything you avoid? Like, what do you read? What do you what do you dismiss as just stuff that's gonna sell your mind, if anything? Like, I, I learned from watching crows eat that they just peck everything and spit out the stuff that's garbage. Um, and that's, you have to kind of absorb it all and go, I can work with this, or yeah, maybe not. Sure, so yeah, I would, I would, you take it all in and you, you decide what is good. And, and on that note, Stephanie Meyer's novel, The Host, is actually really worth reading, even if you thought Twilight was not, not your thing. Um, she is a, she's, a, she's actually, that, that proved that she's an exception. Yeah. As her writing teacher, I can tell you she's actually much better than either of those books even shows, I think. I mean, she's got a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of talent that's in the block of that book, so anyway. Uh, how do you set up architects uh, with another writer that you're working with? Like, if you're coming from two different perspe uh, perspectives and you already have an outline maybe and a goal, how would you set that up if you guys have two separate ideas? But let me suggest that you should never do that, okay? Um, and, and, and let me let me explain why really quickly. Because 50 years from now, when you both die, your grandchildren are going to be fighting over your estates, and it's going to be your constraints. And, and so, so Ren and the like, Revic children, you'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. But what, what about, um, you know, like if you're working like a cartoon, or if you're working like a video game, which one's Oh, right? okay, yeah. Um, well, there is that, so, so having worked on many, many video games, yeah, it kind of is a blender, and you sort of throw everything in, and every so often there's a game that I have worked on or designed, and I can look and go, oh yeah, that that one thing there, that that is my idea. <laughs> um, most of the time, it, I mean, it, there's, there's a huge difference between individual and collaborative work, and video games, the whole point is we are making something greater than any of us can do individually, um, and that is why I also always am working on a book, because, see, I have to be objective. I'm a producer. I have to not be like, oh, I've got all these creative ideas. I have to get into this thing. No, I have to only put the stuff in that matters, makes a difference. Everything else, all that other creative energy is in my books. Always be willing to cut. Yeah. You know what, what I do is when I'm, when I'm pitching ideas to friends and stuff, I wait and see when their eyes sparkle. And when their eyes sparkle, because you, you just watch their eyes, you see this little flashy light come off, and that's when they, that's when they say, Ooh, cool idea. And they'll usually let you know that they think it's a cool idea. But the, the cool ideas, generally, when you start looking at them, they, they tend to be the ones that are archetypal. They, they, you know, it just feels right to both of you. And it usually twists the story in a way that maybe you didn't think it was going to go. I know we're over, but can we take one last question? <laughs> Make it quick. Okay. Quickly, so quick, before they say no. All right. So um, I'm thinking, so my readers are, they decide the journey, they yeah. decide how it goes. How do you, as writers, because I set like a setting environment, how do you guys like stop one of your characters from going down a archetypical or stereotypical like path? Do, do we ever stop them? Assuming you if can it's, stop if it's, them? If it's true to the character, then that's what the character should be doing. They can be awful stuff. They'll run away with the story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But you're supposed to not do that. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with exploring paths, you know? I just say, okay, let's take him down this a little bit ways. If it doesn't work out, I'll, I'll go back and we'll start back. And uh, instead of going left, okay, we'll turn right and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> go. Awesome. Can I get a round of applause for
workshops if you're interested. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to bring them. I got talking to somebody. Uh, and, uh, but I have some down at JJ20. So go down there and have a look. Thank you for buying all the budgets, too. May I have everybody please exit down the back?